You are listening to Congregation Bethel of Manhattan, a Two Testament conservative synagogue serving Manhattan since 1993. Visit us on the web at BethelNYC.org. It is a very consistent challenge for uh, religious leaders as we face portions of scripture like the one we read this morning, Masse, the parasha Masse, or the journeys of. It's a challenge to connect it to real life as opposed to um, it just being sort of poetry that's nice to listen to, moral goals that are kind of helpful what about reality? Well, the journeys of Israel, at this point, what the Torah records is, here's where you started, here's where you went next, and here's where you went next, and here's where you went next, and here's where you went next. It's not a, re it's not a record of stasis, it's a record of a process, of a journey, of journeys. Well, the title of my sermon this morning is The Journeys Continue or them is us. <laughs> them is us again. Here's where we started. It's about 20 blocks south of here. That's the first place Bethel had a sanctuary. In what used to be called the Barbizon Hotel. Do you recognize these two characters? Well, that's the Barbizon, the 64th in Lex. 63rd and Lex, rather. And uh, we jokingly refer to the subway, the F-stop here, as the way to everywhere. Because since we've arrived in New York, everything we've done has revolved around this corner. We always seem to be coming back to this corner. So this is the Barbizon. There, you can see, that is a 30 younger version of me at the piano there. And there's a 30 younger version of my wife who looks the exact same way she did back then. Glory to God. Um, <laughs> and there is our high holiday service. We were uh, packing them in, in the Rousseau, Rousseau room for our first high holiday service. And um, we offered the Jewish population of the churches in New York that were sort of cycle, they were sifting through our doors and sort of checking out the new thing on the block. As soon as we made it clear to them that we were serious about being Jewish, we weren't just having a Christian service that had a few Jewish things in it, we lost a lot of them. <laughs> a lot of people came and checked us out and didn't come back. Um, we have been offering the Jewish people that have been lost to the Jewish world, that are embedded in churches, and, and this sort of forms a submission of ours as we are certainly reaching out to, to people with salvation rescue from their separation from god but we are also part of this generational movement of hayeshuv the return and the return is about jewish people getting hit with that urge that salmon urge to swim upstream back home and is what god is doing among jewish people in these days God made it clear in the scriptures, God does not intend for Jewish people to abandon Jewish life. He simply doesn't intend it. So, you know, if you can find a way in a church to observe the Jewish Shabbat, they don't worship on Saturdays, they worship on Sundays, except if you're Seventh-day Adventist. You know, they don't read from the Torah scroll. They don't pray in Hebrew. Why? Because they're not Jewish. They're not supposed to. It's not required for them. It is required for us. We moved temporarily to the Marriott Marquis on Broadway, the only time we've been out of the Upper East Side. We moved there for a while because the Barbizon shut down for repairs. Here are a bunch of services. There are some people in this room that were in, and that are still members that were still there when we were at the Marriott Marquis. And uh, it was kind of amazing. My eldest son was only like three or four years old when we were going here. And he thought the Marriott Marquis was the synagogue. When we would drive up in a taxi to 45th and Broadway in that massive building, we'd say, Abba, even look, we're at the synagogue. <laughs> we didn't have the heart to tell him. <laughs> our next stop, our next journey, just around the block from the Barbizon Hotel. And the first time we approached them and asked if we could use their building as a meeting place, they said no. 
Now then, something happened very similar to why we're sitting in this room. After a while, I wondered if their no was really a no. We had been at the Marriott Marquis for a few years. Didn't feel right. It just didn't feel like it was where we were supposed to continue. I thought we needed a, a like we have here, we needed a, a, a sidewalk walk-in entrance to our building, to our synagogue. So I contacted the pastor and asked him if the board might reconsider. He said, funny, you should call me. We were just talking about you at our last board meeting, and we decided that we were going to call you and offer you the opportunity to meet here if you wanted. It happened again with this building. It's exactly why we're sitting in this room. So we met at the Rock Church for many years. And we were there until, this might be of interest to the security people we have now, um, until we became the only synagogue in all five boroughs to receive a direct Muslim terror threat. And we received it twice. They came to the church building twice, they turned on the intercom, their faces were masked, not like ours are today for COVID, but they were masked. And they said into the intercom, get rid of the Jews or else. And the church said, okay. <laughs> and we were homeless. And they told a cover story about it that wasn't exactly accurate. But, as always seems to happen, God moved us to a better place. We wound up in St. Jean Baptiste, Roman Catholic Church on 76th Street, which was such a delightful group of people. Just we had a wonderful working relationship with these people in this building. And when the time came for us to leave, they actually cried. The only reason we had to leave was not because of any problem between us or the church. There was a disgruntled ex-congregant who went to the diocese and said, that church is hosting non-Catholic ministries in their building. So they received an order from the diocese to get rid of every non-Catholic ministry in their building. And... If you, don't know, if you know anything about Roman Catholic nuns and priests, they take a vow of obedience. Somebody superior in the church gives them an order, they salute and say, yes sir, yes ma'am. That's it. No argument, no defiance, total submission. So the, the director of the, of the high school, with whom we are still friends and still in touch, um, told me, weeping, in her office. She had to ask us to pack up and leave. And um, we are all still friends to this day, Facebook friends, collegi collegiate in our relationship. And she wrote us the most beautiful letter of recommendation imaginable to anyone who would be a future landlord about what it was like to have us in the building. We've also had the privilege of dancing in Jerusalem as a Kehillah. I didn't want to fill this with pictures of Jerusalem because I want to keep us focused, but I, I just, you know, whole generations of Jewish people never got to be in Jerusalem, much less worship on Mount Zion, in Jerusalem, repeatedly, and at the wall, and in the city, and have the ongoing relationship. And even as I stand at Bima now, my wife, our Rebetzin, one of the worship leaders and uh, elders of our synagogue, is in Israel visiting our eldest son, who, as an IDF veteran, is living in Israel and working in Israel. And... Um, so the connection continues. The journeys continue. One year ago, almost to the day, I sat at the exact Shabbat table that she was sitting at last night. So here's our last home before this one, CPC. It was lovely. It was really lovely, right up until the time it wasn't. That's the way things go in this world. Things are lovely until they ain't. And then it was time to move. We had more celebrations there than I could put. We, have, we had B'nai Mitzvah ceremonies, weddings. I mean, I could put pictures up here we could look at for the next hour. But I just am doing a precy because I want to move forward from our journeys. The journey now, remember, we follow the cloud. We, we're not in charge. We don't decide how long and where and what's permanent and what's transient. We're following, we, we are, we are we are the rightfully submitted, governed people of a governor, and we follow the governor's directives. So when the cloud says move, we move. Where has the cloud moved us? Well, right where you're sitting. This is the way it goes. 
and what you are sitting in, here is where we have been led and given to fulfill our callings and to fill. One of the first things the people who run this church told us is, when or if you get too large for, the, for Clark Hall, you're welcome to use the sanctuary. So we have room to expand. As it is now, we're barely open to visitors and our room is already half full. They say when you are 70% full, you're actually hindering growth. People walk in a room and see it's 70% full. They decide, you know, I'm not really needed here. It's repulsive for some reason on an emotional level. People want to feel like there's room for them. So what happens next, God only knows. But the journeys of Bethel continue. The journey continues. It really absolutely blows my mind when I think about the journey um, that I personally have been on, and I know the journey of many of you individually, what you have been on. Uh, suffice it to say that while it hasn't been dull, it hasn't been easy. You know, the, the, uh, it tends to be, in my experience, let me see if I have any other, yes, will the journey be with you? That really is the question. What will your part be in going to the lost sheep of the house of Israel from here? Very important, very important precept. Scripture tells us whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. I'm going to be very vocal about this as we go forward. This is not you giving Bethel a chance to prove itself to you. Let's wait for the rabbi and Robinson to pull a rabbit out of their hat to show us that God is with them. Now, God is doing this quietly in ways that... <laughs> um, I'm getting a real charge out of seeing our new... We've never had security personnel. We have to now because of the climate in, in our present society. Um, we finalized the arrangements for our security just yesterday. And before the end of yesterday, I had a spontaneous, unsolicited donation come in to Bethel that covered the, the, this coming year of security almost exactly. It's all, bought, it's all paid for. It doesn't stress our budget at all. That, now, God didn't blow a trumpet to you and say, I'm proving Bethel to you all. You know, it's, God is very quietly cooperating with his work, and, and we are co-laborers with Messiah, and God is doing sort of quiet miracles. But this question hangs in the air in regard to, like, how really, how really on board are we, meaning whatever it is that it takes. As the American founding fathers put it, our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And not one of them reneged. They stuck it out to the end. They lost homes, spouses, children, families, lives, lands, bank accounts, possessions. The, 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 the things they laid on the line for freedom, not one of them backed out. I'll never forget the words that were spoken not far south here in the Upper East Side. Just go down Lexington Avenue, you'll find a plaque on a building. I think it's in the, in the high 50s. It says that Nathan Hale was hanged here for treason. And Nathan Hale said, I, my only regret is I have only one life to give for my country. It's my only regret. I only have one life to give. Our synagogue has a beautiful, professionally executed logo. Here's what it looked like half done. There are some graphical mistakes in it, some less than, than optimal choices. Here it is, fully done. This is now our logo. Much better than the previous one. It was executed by a professional artist sitting in this room. And she didn't stop until it was perfect. Revision after revision after revision after revision after revision after revision after revision. People, you know, maybe with language input to give, but not professional artistry. Cooperative, the body working with its gifts working in syncope. Now, why is that our logo? Well, you might notice that the two spies carrying that fruit embedded in the center is the Jewish star. Because we are carrying back, and the city is in the background. This city. 
we are carrying back to the Jewish people of Beth of Manhattan, of Manhattan, something that has not been on their radar for a very long time, centuries, which is an authentically interwoven Jewish life with two Testament faith. Here is our mandate, Matthew 10, verses 5 and 6. Matthew 10, verses 5 and 6. Do not go in the way of the Gentiles. Was that Yeshua being negative? Was that, was Yeshua committing a microaggression against non-Jewish races? No. He was being specific about calling. People are not called to the whole world. Oh, I'm called to the whole world. No, you're not. The whole world is much too big for you. Yeshua of Nazareth was called to one small nation and to 12 people primarily. And that's the way the kingdom of heaven works, he told us. Is it starts out small like a mustard seed and then it grows out from there. Matthew 10, 5 and 6, do not go in the way of the Gentiles. And do not enter any city of the Samaritans. The Samaritans were living in the center of Israel and they had been basically so highly replaced by Assyrian invaders that it wasn't really like a part of Israel for a long time. Yeshua said, but rather, now that's a choice-making word. Don't go here, don't go there. Rather, meaning putting aside those two options, go here. This is having a calling. Rather, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's our calling, to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I'll split that group in, in half. There are people who don't know God and there are Jews who are living separated from their own identity as Jews. We're called to both of them. I find myself being exercised by God more and more as time goes by that I've been very, very wary of what the Christian world calls sheep stealing, which means that you recruit people that are already a part of a particular congregation to another congregation. You're not trying to make new believers, you're trying to steer believers who are already believers to go from one work to another. Well, what I'm trying to do is get Jewish people embedded in non-Jewish congregations to stop committing cultural suicide. Living in self-hatred. There are Jewish believers who are in churches because they are hiding their Jewish identity or hiding from their Jewish identity or because among the church which is totally bewildered by the Jewish people, they're terrified of us because they think every single one of us was born with a Bible in our hand and that we are automatic Bible scholars. So if you're a Jew in a church, you tend to be the church Jew. The church Jew, you're the authority. Like everyone goes to you to find out about stuff Jewish, even if you don't know all that much. You're, you still know more than they do. And it's a very, very, it's a very appealing thing on the basis of ego. It's a lot like being getting admitted to Harvard. You know, when you're in your high school and you're number one in your class, that feels great. You get admitted, I read an essay by someone, what a shock it was to go to Harvard after you'd been admitted, walking around on the campus, you're a nobody. You're just, you know, the same as everybody else. You're starting from scratch. Because despite the fact that you were part of that 1% or less than 1% to get into Harvard, now that you're in Harvard, everybody has the same strengths you do. So for Jewish people to come in, to leave the church and come into a Jewish congregation can be a very complex thing. Some people come from families where their, their immediate ancestors were persecuted for being Jewish. They may have lost a job because they're Jewish. They may have lost a girlfriend or boyfriend because they're Jewish. God only knows what experiences have created in them a, a reflex to distance themselves from their Jewish identities. Debbie and I were laughing about this as we had children. What, what to name them? We were in agreement. We're going to give our children names where there's no chance anyone's going to think they're Irish or Scandinavian. This is not my son Lars Cohen. You know, <laughs> our children, we gave them names. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Lost. They're lost. They don't know they're lost, but they're lost. The people who are without God probably aren't aware that they're lost. People, Jews living 
separated from the Jewish identities probably aren't aware that they're lost. They probably don't think that there's anything really all that important about them choosing to live either as a God follower or as a Jew. Eternity is at stake, and the will of God for our people is at stake. So let's get down to bedrock as I close this. Here's the way Rav Saul is referred to as Paul the Apostle in Greek, but the words are uh, Rav Shaul HaShaliach, Rabbi Saul, the, the, the Shaliach, the emissary, that's his, his identity in his native language. In Acts 17, verse 23, starting in verse 23, Paul says to this group of people he's speaking to, examining the objects of your worship in this town, I found an altar with this inscription in Greek, agnostoteo, to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance this I proclaim to you with specificity. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not dwell in temples made with human hands, nor is he served by human hands, as if he needed anything. I love it. To me, that sounds like someone from Brooklyn. As if he needed anything? As if God needs anything. Like God needs something you would make for him? Since he himself gives all people life and breath and all things. He made from one human every nation of humankind, genetic science agrees, by the way, to live on all the face of the earth, having determined, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. The boundaries. What are the boundaries of your calling? Are you called to Manhattan? I am. That means I don't, I'm not looking at houses in North Carolina. Why? I'm called to Manhattan. I'm called to live as close to here or in here to be available to the people to whom I'm called as possible. Am I called to the Jewish people? Yes. So my life is Jewish. I'm not living an everything spiritual life. I'm not going to churches on Sundays, scratching a Christmas itch, doing anything like that. I am called to. Rather than that, I am called to this the boundaries of our habitation, and that all people from all nations would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, although he's not far from any of us. Why close the sermon with this idea? 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. I deliver to you what is of first importance, what I also received, that Messiah died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and raised on the third day again, according to the scriptures. Why are we inviting attention? Well, God is motivated by this. Romans 8, 31 and 32. Romans 8, 31, 32. If God is for us, who can be against us? Are you really solidly rooted in that idea that God is for you? Because I know it hasn't been easy. You know, the people in the land of Israel, you know, they went into malarial swamps where their comrades died by the hundreds of malaria. To clear out the swamps. You gotta have a pretty strong faith that God is with you when your friends are dropping like flies, bitten by mosquitoes, being shot at by snipers, being attacked by bands of fedayim. For us, on this little kibbutz in the midst of Manhattan, if God is for us, who can be against us? Here it is. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not with him freely give us all things? That means everything that we're supposed to have. It doesn't mean you're, you know, a Bentley, you know, or a lifetime subscription to the newest uh, fashions from Ralph Lauren or Armani. It doesn't mean that. It means he will give you what you need for your calling. Have you carved your soul into contentment with that? Let me say that again. Have you carved your soul into contentment with that so that you truly don't have the ambition to get stuff. Your ambition is to have enough to do what you're called to do where you're called to do it. That's where your ambition begins and that's where it ends. You have no big ambition to make sure, well, you know, I can't go to my high school reunion. I, you know, that person married so-and-so and has all this and lives there and goes here and does that. Who cares? Do you think those will be fond memories in hell? If a person has lived a God-rebellion life, do you think it will bring them any comfort? 
That's like having a nice dream and waking up in a house that's on fire from which you're stuck in it eternally. In which you're stuck eternally. Once you wake up from the dream, all you've got is torment. Who cares what stuff anybody else has? Do you have enough to be where you are, to do what you got to do, for God in line with his will? That's it. Romans 8, Romans 5, rather, verses 8 and 9. God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Messiah died for us. That's the bedrock of this message. Love. Love that rescues us from our deluded state. The sages of the Talmud know that Messiah would die for us. I don't have time to go into all the scriptures that deal with that, but we know that he was pierced for our transgressions as the prophets foretold, and the sages of the Talmud agree that means this. So in sum, are you experiencing doubts, troubles, conflicts? Welcome to human life. That's what it's all about, is that the journey is challenge, ecstasy, challenge, ecstasy, challenge, ecstasy. We, we get punctuated ecstasy, and it's punctuated mostly by discomfort. God is for you. In connection to him is the fulfillment of your human createdness. The perfect God in his love has removed the blockage between you and him that your human sinning represents. For love's sake, he did this. As we said at the start, a positive eternity is what's at shape in these kingship decisions. So, finally, what about being small? What if Bethel never becomes a mega congregation? Well, since the human race is made up of a pie of which we occupy less than 1% of the sliver, our sliver is a sliver of like a sliver of a sliver, whatever it is that happens among the Jewish world is never going to be as big among 13 million people as it will be among 7 or 8 billion. Simply not going to be that way. Yeshua taught us this to ratchet our expectations into proper perspective. He taught us in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. But the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And few are those who find it. Well, if that's true of all of humanity, that among the 7 billion, 8 billion humans, few are those who find eternal life. We are few among the 7 or 8 billion, so there we will be few of few. We have to be all right with that. If we're not okay with however God leads us and whatever God leads us to sow into, we're always going to be longing for things other people have. I've always loved this scripture. I just Moses, after watching that fire burn all day long and into the night, he said in his heart, I must now turn aside and see this great sight, why the fire is not, why the bush is not consumed. He knew it was more than natural, but he had to close the distance between himself and it by choosing to journey to it. And when, it tells us in scripture, when he made the decision, I will now, now turn around and see this great sight. Why this is happening? It says, then the voice of God called to me from the midst of the bush. Turn is what it's all about. That's how Moses became Moses. Let's stand up and let's turn. Let's accept with the word Alenu upon us. Let us accept this incumbency to be truth followers and especially to be custodians of the mandate to go to, not to go in the way of the Gentiles, but to go to, rather to, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Together with me. You are listening to Congregation Bethel of Manhattan, a Two Testament conservative synagogue serving Manhattan since 1993. Visit us on the web at BethelNYC.org.